How's my witch laugh? I feel like that was a pretty decent witch laugh. And today, I was thinking about Halloween. I was thinking about Salem witches. By the way, really an incredible moment in American history when you think about the Salem witch trials. You remember them, of course. You learned about them in school. They were a series of hearings and prosecutions of people that were accused of being witches in colonial Massachusetts between February 1692 and May 1693. What was the total number? Well, about 200 people in that tiny town were accused. 30 of them were found guilty. 19 of them were executed by hanging, the majority of them being women. 14 of them are women. Five of them were men, as well as two dogs. Not sure how we needed to execute dogs in the Salem witch trials. There's even one guy named Giles Corey who died under torture after he refused to even enter in a plea. He was 81 years old. At least five other people simply died in jail. So how did it work? Well, there would be someone that concluded that a loss or an illness or a death that they suffered was caused by witchcraft. So I'm like, "Uh, I have the flu. Definitely a witch gave this to me. Or, you know, I lost a relative. This only happened because of a witch. So I would be the accuser and I would enter in a complaint against the alleged witch with the local magistrates. And if they deemed that it was somehow credible, like, yeah, Candace definitely got the flu and obviously a spell was cast upon her by so-and-so, they would then have that person arrested and brought in for public examination, which was essentially a series of interrogations where they pressed the accused to confess. So the History Channel has an archive of seven bizarre witch trial tests. I'm going to go through five of them with you because it is just incredible to consider that this actually took place in American history. One was the swim test. I think we're all familiar with this one. As a part of the infamous swim test, the accused witches were dragged to the nearest body of water, stripped to their undergarments, bound, and then tossed to see if they would sink or they would float. According to this logic, an innocent person would sink like a stone, but a witch would simply bob on the surface. Now, you can probably conclude in your own mind how that didn't go well sometimes because if they were innocent and they sank... Yeah, a lot of them accidentally drowned. The innocent then drowned in the witch trial test. There was also the prayer test. I would have passed this. Medieval wisdom held that witches were incapable of speaking scripture aloud. So accused sorcerers were made to recite selections from the Bible. Usually it was the Lord's Prayer without making any mistakes or omissions. Now, to be clear, a mistake could have been you just fumbled the word because you were nervous. Maybe you have a little bit of a lisp. Maybe you don't know how to read. But they viewed any errors, whether it was because you were illiterate or nervous, as proof that you were in league with the devil. The touch test worked by claiming that victims of sorcery would have a special reaction to physical contact with their evildoer. So if I am am sick and you are then forced to touch me, I would magically come out of my sickness. A non-reaction would signal innocence, but if the victim came out of their fit, it was seen as proof that the suspect had placed them under some sort of a spell. This one is interesting. It's called a witch cake test. In cases of mysterious illness or possession, witch hunters would take a sample of the victim's urine, mix it with rye meal and ashes, and bake it into a cake. The stomach-turning concoction was then fed to a dog or an animal helper of witches, in the hope that the beast would fall under its spell and reveal the name of the guilty sorcerer. And then, of course, I think this one's got my favorite, witch marks. Witch hunters often had their suspects stripped and publicly examined for signs of an unsightly blemish that witches were said to receive upon making their pact with Satan. So yeah, if you're a person and you get moles, yeah, that would be called the devil's mark. And they would believe that that meant, obviously, that you were in league with the devil. So it's incredible to kind of go back and to consider that this took place in American history, but it doesn't really feel like a relic of the past when you consider just the political landscape, say, the things that happened, the movements that happened. I'll give you one example of a modern witch trial. Do you remember the black square test on Instagram when BLM was trending? And suddenly, if you were white, you were definitely a racist if you did not make it to Instagram to post a timely black square because that meant that you stood with black people. That meant that your whole life, you never had a racist thought ever. God forbid you were a celebrity during that time. You did not post a black square. There it was, guilty. You are a racist, did not pass the trial. But the one that I'm reflecting upon today is 
the Me Too witch hunt. It was incredible. And I am here to remind you of it because people forget how nasty it was. You see, the right likes to pretend that they're always on the side of goodness, when in reality, what really happens is the right will wake up to wrongness faster than the left. But usually when these movements come around, conservatives are in support of them as well. And there was no greater example of that than the Me Too movement. I remember where I was when that hashtag started trending. because I almost lost my job as a conservative speaker for refusing to kowtow to the idea that women should just be blanket believed if they use the hashtag Me Too. And let me tell you, the stories that women were sharing under that hashtag were getting more and more ridiculous. It wasn't just, oh, I you know, was raped in a dark alley. Soon it became, you know, I was hit on at work. Somebody asked me on a date, you know, a colleague asked me on a date and I was uncomfortable next to the coffee machine. Hashtag me too. The big, great reckoning we were going to have men in the workplace. They're all monsters. They're all demons. And people were sharing ridiculous stories. And at that time I tweeted this. I said, the entire premise of me too is that women are stupid, weak, and inconsequential too stupid to know what men might want if you come into their hotel room late at night, too weak to turn around and tell someone not to touch your ass again, or too inconsequential to realize this. You'll also recall at that time there were women who were telling stories about how they went to the hotel room of a man at three o'clock in the morning, and they were very surprised when a man put the moves on them. It was very surprising. Why, Why would a man do that? Well, I don't know. Maybe because you're signaling to him that you are okay with him putting the moves on you because it's the middle of the night and you're in his hotel room. But no, 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 you couldn't say that at this time. But I did. I went on to say the biggest problem with the hashtag Me Too movement is that it turned sexual assault into a trend and simultaneously drowned out the voices of real rape victims who deserve to be heard. And I said I would speak on that issue at an upcoming conference in a few days because it was time for real women empowerment. And of course... When anything becomes a trend, whether it's BLM or Me Too, it becomes problematic. I also tweeted, modern feminism is so toxic. It is single-handedly deteriorating relationships and eventual motherhood. I will always speak out against what has become a rabid cult of misery. If you believe in equality between men and women, you cannot be a feminist today. Again, the date on that, June 11, 2018. And oh my goodness, like I said, conservatives and liberals alike came for my head. How dare you? Conservatives actually became liberals. They started basically saying their qualifications were they went through sexual assault and that I had no right to speak on the matter of hashtag me too, that every woman's story deserved to be heard and believed, not just heard, but believed. Kimberly Corbin tweeted at me, as a conservative and a lawfully armed survival, survivor of rape, I respectfully and vehemently disagree. Me too isn't a problem with women. It's also not a problem with men. It's a problem with a culture that lays blame upon victims and shames them into silence. Again, the suggestion there that every woman using the Me Too hashtag deserved to be heard, deserved to be believed. Mira Sorvino, who was an actress on the left, tweeted, you are seriously deficient in your knowledge and your empathy. There was also Benji Backer, another conservative, who wrote, this is abhorrent. Gosh, I am abhorrent. It is sad that I even need to say it, but most conservatives do not believe this. I repeat, most conservatives do not believe this. We stand with the women who are abused, taken advantage of, or treated unequally. Hashtag Me Too, like any movement, has flaws, but it's inspiring women across the globe to speak out about difficult situations I cannot begin to understand. To call women stupid and weak for hiding in the shadows of being raped assaulted and abused is absolutely asinine and cowardly. Now, I wasn't talking about rape victims. I was talking about the Me Too trend, just like BLM trend was not talking about victims of racism. It just became trendy to perceive everything as racism. And with Me Too, it became trendy to perceive everything as an aggression by men. It became trendy to call everything sexual assault, even if it wasn't, even if it was just a bad date, a guy trying to put the moves on you, a guy asking you on a date. It was awful. And then there were headlines. Oh my gosh, you guys have no idea. I was so under fire. This one from the Dallas Morning News. Me too makes women look stupid, weak, conservative figurehead Candace Owens says ahead of the Dallas Women's Summit. Town Hall wrote, Candace Owens take on rape survivors and the Me Too movement is all wrong. Again, like I said, left and right, I was condemned. There were people at the time I was working for Turning Point USA Young women who were coming out crying, saying, how can she still be the communications director if she doesn't support the Me Too movement? 
They wanted me to be fired. I'm not kidding. They were young girls who wanted me to be fired because I did not understand the importance of this trending hashtag, except I did understand it. I understood exactly what was happening. I was watching men lose their jobs, having to step down from their careers on the basis of one woman using a tweet and a hashtag without any further examination because women liked the trend of Me Too. So people that were not actually victims and some people who just really wanted to seek revenge on certain men, maybe they went on a date with them, they didn't get called back, were now being empowered to make up allegations. And for a while, those allegations went unchecked. It was a matriarchal movement. As I said, we were existing under a matriarchy and men were suffering beneath it. I believe in due process. I don't believe that a tweet and a hashtag can condemn somebody. I don't believe that a tweet and a hashtag, even if it's being used by tons of women, necessarily means that a man is guilty of a crime. And so I stood up against it virtually alone. Actually, credit to Charlie Kirk, who stood by me because he understood how dangerous the movement was as a man. But no, most people on the left and the right just kowtowed to it. It was a new order, and women were allowed to say whatever they wanted, and they had to be hashtag believed. And so you can imagine how great I feel today that that it has all crumbled and people understand the toxicity of the Me Too movement. And what's even greater is that men are now standing up to these allegations. They are fighting women in court and they are scoring some big wins. Which brings me to the ex-MLB pitcher Trevor Bauer, a woman who accused him of a violent assault in 2021 has now been made to settle that legal dispute. Rather than me tell you his story of how insane it is, how this woman absolutely entrapped him because she was very much likely empowered by the hashtag Me Too to make up allegations, I would rather you listen to Trevor Bauer in his own words. Take a listen. Next victim, star pitcher for the Dodgers. A text Lindsay Hill sent to a friend before she ever even met me. What should I steal? She asked another in reference to visiting my house for the first time. The answer, take his money. So how might that work? I'm going to his house Wednesday, she said. I already have my hooks in. You know how I roll. Then, after the first time we met, net worth is 51 mil, she said. You better secure the bag, was the response. Uh, But but how is she going to do that? Need daddy to choke me out, she said. Being an absolute whore to try to get in on his 51 million, read another text. Uh, Then, after the second time we met, former Padres pitcher Jacob Nix told her, you got to get this bag. I'll give you 50,000, Lindsay replied. Her AA sponsor asked her at one point, do you feel a tiny bit guilty? Not really, she replied. Since then, her legal team has approached me multiple times about coming to a financial settlement. But as I have done since day one, I refuse to pay her even a single cent. Uh, In August of 2021, Lindsay Hill's claims were heard in court. And during those legal proceedings, critical information was deliberately and unlawfully concealed from me and my legal team. Uh, information like this video, which was taken by Lindsay Hill herself the morning after she claimed she was brutally attacked, emotionally traumatized, and desperate to get away from me. Uh, And now we have the metadata, so there can be no dispute. Uh, It was taken mere minutes before she left my house on the morning of May 16th, 2021, without my knowledge or consent, of course. Uh, In it, you can see her lying in bed next to me while I'm sleeping, smirking at the camera without a care in the world, or any marks on her face. I think it paints a pretty clear picture of what actually happened the evening of May 15th and why the video was originally concealed from us. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, After hearing the evidence available to her, Judge Diana Gold Saltman found that Lindsay Hill had misled the court. She found her claims to be materially misleading. Uh, She denied her request for a domestic violence restraining order, and she found that no sexual assault or non-consensual conduct took place. Now, Some of you might not know about restraining order hearings. I know I didn't, but uh, I've since learned that uh, it's extremely rare for a request for a restraining order to be denied because the standard of proof that you need to obtain one is extremely low. So you can make of that what you will. The fact is I was never arrested. I was never charged with a crime and I won the only legal proceeding that took place without my side of the story even being heard. Uh, And most importantly, as I've said from day one, I never sexually assaulted Lindsay Hill or anyone else for that matter. So I sued her, which prompted her to countersue me. Quite frankly, regardless of the outcome in court, I've paid significantly more in legal fees than Lindsay Hill could ever pay me in her entire life. Uh, And I knew that would be the case going in. But the lawsuit was never about the money for me. It was the only way for me to obtain critical information to clear my name. 
the discovery process in that lawsuit recently concluded, at which point uh, Lindsay Hill's legal team again came to us with another proposal to resolve the case. Uh, this time, however, they weren't seeking any money from me. Having received uh, much of the information that had been hidden from us, uh, a small portion of which I've referenced here, um, I was willing to agree to the terms proposed. Both parties would drop their respective lawsuits, and neither of us would pay either side any money. Um, I also retained my right to speak publicly about the case, something I have not been at liberty to do since June of 2021. So, as of today, both lawsuits have been settled. Now, over the last two years, I've been forced to defend my integrity uh, and my reputation in a very public setting. But hopefully this is the last time I have to do so, as I'd prefer to just remain focused on doing my job, uh, winning baseball games and entertaining fans around the world. So today, I'm happy to be moving on with my life. So what did we learn from that video? Well, we learned that Lindsay Hill is a liar who was after money. Just like we learned after time and due process that Amber Heard was a liar who was after more power and more fame. And the same can be said about the entire Me Too movement, that women, bad women, who pretended to be weak, who pretended, as I said, to be stupid, were in fact conniving, who understood that with a movement with this much power where there are no checks and balances, where you can just say something with a hashtag and people will come to your aid and tell you how brave and wonderful and stunning you are and roll out the red carpet. Yeah. That, for some people, proved to be irresistible, and they made up allegations because they wanted fame or money or power or a community of other Me Too witches to rally around them. Maybe they just wanted friends, but it was toxic. It always was toxic, and I was happy to be proven right in the long run. What can be said of Trevor Bauer? Trevor Bauer is a hero. He is an example to men who are all existing under this matriarchy, make no mistake. We're all fearful to have regular relations with women, that when you are telling the truth, just as it was for me when I tweeted those things, you double down. You double down on it and you let these things play out in the court system. You let these things play out with time. Because in the end, in the end, not in the beginning, truth always wins. All right, if you like this video, you are going to like the full episode even better. You can find it by clicking right here.